Welcome back. President Obama has just finished meeting with cabinet officials to talk about preparedness and response efforts to the H1N1 virus. Three federal agencies will join with Sesame Workshop to launch national PSA campaigns stressing healthy habits to prevent the H1N1 flu infection. The president speaking now. Let's listen live on Bloomberg. About our ongoing efforts to prepare this country for the H1N1 flu. As I said when we saw the first cases of this virus back in the spring, uh, I don't want anybody to be alarmed, uh, but I do want everybody to be prepared. Our plans and decisions are based on the best scientific information available, and as the situation changes, we will continue to update the public. Stay home if you're sick. Wash your hands frequently. Cover your sneezes with your sleeve, not your hands, and take all the necessary precautions to, to stay healthy. I know it sounds simple, but it's important and it works. We're obviously focused on what needs to be done immediately, uh, identifying and mitigating cases of H1N1 in the United States. We don't know for certain that this will end up being uh, more severe than other seasonal flus that we have. And it's been noted, I think, before that you have uh, over 36,000 people die uh, on average every year from seasonal flus. You have 200,000 hospitalizations. It may turn out that H1N1 is, uh, runs its course like uh, ordinary flus. Uh, and there are indications that in Mexico, at least, uh, what you saw were relatively young, healthy people. Okay, why do you keep calling this the Chinese virus? There are reports of dozens of incidents of bi bias against Chinese Americans in this country. Your own aide, Secretary Azar, says he does not use this term. He says ethnicity does not cause the virus. Why do you keep using this? A lot of it comes say from it's China. racist. It's not racist at all, no, not at all. It comes from China, that's why comes from China. I and want to be accurate. About yeah, please, in John. This please. AIDS behind you. Uh, Are you I have with a great, this term? I have great love uh, for all of the people from our country. But uh, as you know, China tried to say at one point, maybe they stopped now, that it was caused by American soldiers. That can't happen. It's not going to happen. Not as long as I'm president. Uh, it comes from China. The virus has even touched the Obama administration, an Energy Department staffer who traveled to Mexico preparing for the president's trip three weeks ago has contracted the flu. According to the latest figures here at the command center, there are now 91 confirmed cases of H1N1 virus in 11 states, but they say those numbers are changing all the time. It's also sending 400,000 courses to Mexico to assist with the outbreak there. This new virus, this virus that we're dealing with now, is sensitive to both Relenza and Tamiflu. It is a strain of a virus that we have never seen before uh, in humans. In fact, we've never really seen it before at all. And where is Dr. Fauci? Uh, I don't know, but every time you ask that question, whenever he's not here, you look, you say, where is he? And you'll say, is there a problem? No problem whatsoever. Every time he's not here, Sometimes I'll ask him to come because that's the first question that you and a couple of others from the fake news establishment ask is, where's Dr. Fauci? We're doing great together. President Barack Obama has declared swine flu a national emergency. The change comes as the U.S. death toll from H1N1 swine flu is topped a thousand. Forty-six states have widespread flu activity, but distribution of the swine flu vaccine has moved slower than expected. Only 11 million doses have gone out. The government hopes to have about 50 million doses of swine flu vaccine out by mid-November and 150 million in December. Matt Friedman, The Associated Press. There have been 130 cases reported in the U.S. at this point. It's spreading, albeit slowly. The Transportation Secretary says it is safe to fly, even though Vice President Biden suggested otherwise in comments yesterday. And scientists now say the strain appears to be relatively mild. But... The fear and the concerns have been anything but mild. David Muir has been tracking this story for us. David, how are you doing? You know about all the fear out there, Chris. And in a sign, an indicator this morning of just how concerned the parents are, the public is to know more about flu. Take a look at the number of Yahoo searches for pandemic this week, spiking more than 8,000%. And this morning, parents are still trying to decipher some mixed messages out there. I feel like I'm a biohazard. Everyone's wearing the masks. Meantime, a quarter million school children are home this morning as the number of states closing schools grows. Many parents wondering, are all of these closings too much? 
For parents, the messages have been mixed. Talking about flying, Vice President Biden said on national TV, I wouldn't go anywhere in confined places now. One person sneezes, it goes all the way through the aircraft. The administration then quickly said flying is safe. But all this back and forth of warnings have many parents wondering if the government, the scientists, know something that parents don't. There's no scientist or public health expert in the world that has the answer yet to this very basic question. Is this going to get a lot worse and will it get a lot worse in the short term? This is believed to be ground zero in the swine flu outbreak. La Gloria, a remote Mexican farming village that time forgot and that the world would never know but for a five-year-old boy who was very, very sick with swine flu a month ago. Today, we found a very healthy Edgar Hernandez with his little brother and father on the village's dusty main street. Were you sick? Yes, he says. Sick. You were sick? Very, muy enfermo? Very sick, I ask. Yes, he says, with a cough. How do you feel now, I ask? Good, See? says the boy. Todo mejor. See? Tres días en cama. Edgar's father told us it was late March when his son spent three days in bed. Muy enfermo? Was he very sick? He had a high fever, he says. He was sweating. And when did you learn that uh, your son had swine flu? Just on Sunday, he says. I was watching on TV and they were saying they were looking for the first person who had swine flu. Then the doctor came and told us it was our son. It was a, una sorpresa. Yes, it was a surprise. What wasn't a surprise was that his son got the flu. In March, more than 800 people in this town of 2,000 got sick. No one died and it was only after swine flu started to spread that Mexican government investigators came to look at the outbreak in La Gloria. She was told not to say anything more to us. When people here heard that a case of swine flu had been traced to this area, few were surprised. We also met a security guard who works for the company that owns these farms. No, you're not getting in, said the security guard. Some of your neighbors think that, you, that this came from the pig farms nearby. Yes, he says, they're just eight kilometers away. We would like them all to leave because they're going to infect us all. Different subject, if I may Except ask. We're covering a different subject today. Go ahead. Different subject, if I, Go ahead, if I may ask. Try Mr. One. President, you have said nobody could have seen this pandemic coming. Uh, but in fact, Secretary Azar at a biodefense summit in April 2019 said, of course, the people, uh, of course, the thing that people ask, what keeps you most up at night in the biodefense world? Pandemic flu, of course. I think everyone in this room probably shares that concern. Your own Health and Human Services Secretary was aware that this had the potential of being a very big problem around the world, a pandemic of this nature. Who dropped the ball? A chance to get the hard to find H1N1 vaccine produced a polite stampede of parents and not so happy children in Fairfax, Virginia this morning. Oh yeah, it's definitely hard to get. It's the only place you can find it right now. Whole families skipped Saturday morning cartoons and braved the rain and the line to snap up 12,000 doses of the drug. Experts say it will likely spread further. So much like a disaster declaration before a hurricane, the president today declared the swine flu a national emergency. The White House says it's not meant to scare anyone. It simply loosens some bureaucratic red tape to make it easier for hospitals to get what they need should the epidemic get worse. Delays in producing the H1 vaccine means some of the children we saw getting shots today may have trouble getting the recommended second shot a few weeks from now. The White House said there'd be 120 million doses of the vaccine available by this fall. They've cut that prediction to 50 million doses they hope to have ready by mid-November. The key point here, Jeff, is we don't know what the future will bring in terms of H1N1 cases, and that is largely why the president took this preparative step to declare this uh, national emergency. But basically, the earlier we get the vaccines, the better. Absolutely. Okay, Dr. Jennifer Ashton, thank you so much. Well, I always knew that pandemics are one of the worst things could happen. Uh, there's been nothing like this since probably 1917. That was the big one in Europe. It started actually here and went to Europe, probably. Uh, uh, I've heard about, excuse me, wait a minute, let me finish. I've heard about this for a long time, pandemics. You don't want pandemics. And I don't think he was talking about a specific pandemic. He was talking about the threat of a pandemic could happen, and it could happen. Most people thought it wouldn't, and most people didn't understand the severity of it. This is very severe. What's happened is very severe. And the government is spending $250 million to buy 13 million more courses of Tamiflu and Relenza. President Obama explained the move in a special cabinet meeting. 
even if it turns out that uh, the H1N1 uh, is relatively mild on the front end, it could come back in a more virulent form during the actual flu season. The man spearheading flu preps at Health and Human Services says hospitals will never have enough beds to handle a pandemic. It's just not cost effective to build those facilities and have them sit empty. He is confident, though, that there are enough medical supplies and doctors, and they can be shifted around the country as needed. Because most countries are now advising against travel to Mexico, airlines are starting to slash service, some by as much as 50 percent. Katie? All right, Nancy Cordes, thanks a lot. If you are preparing for a pandemic, if this government were preparing for a pandemic, why is it we don't have enough masks? Why is it we don't have enough medical equipment in this Previous country? Previous administrations gave us very little ammunition for the military and very little shelf space. Let, let me just tell you, you know it, you know the answer. Uh, the previous administration, uh, the shelves were empty. The shelves were empty. So what you should do is speak to the people from the previous administration, Jim, and ask them that question. Because the shelves were empty. And you know what else? The military shelves were also empty. We had no ammunition, literally. And that was said by one of your favorite generals. We have, sir, we have no ammunition. Guess what? We had very little medical supply also. The president talked about parents and businesses having a contingency plan in case more, uh, more children need to stay home for, from school. Do you know exactly what he means by contingency plan? Well well, I, yes, I do. For example, that uh, uh, the a, a parent whose uh, child's school is closed uh, out of a precaution or because there has been a confirmed case of a uh, of flu uh, um, is, should not take that child then to a daycare center. They're going to have to take them home. And the hope is that the employers will have, uh, will be generous in terms of how they treat that employee's necess necessary action of taking the child home and not being at work. And so the urging is the contingency plans the businesses should have if they're going, if this hits in a way that their, their uh, employees have to care for their children. Our Jake Tapper asked the president if he thought that the previous administration had sanctioned torture, and this is how the president responded. Mr. President, you said several times that the United States has ramped up testing, but the United States is still not testing per capita as many, res as many people as other countries like South Korea. Why is that, and when do you think that that number will be on par with other countries? Yeah, well, and it's, Dr. it's very much on par. The, the, look, no. and you should be saying congratulations instead of asking a really a snarky question because I know exactly what you mean by that. You said repeatedly that you think that some of the equipment that governors are requesting they don't actually need. You said New York might need I, not, I might not need thirty thousand. You said it on I Sean Hannity's on, Fox News. You said you know that why, you don't, might, why don't you some, people act? Let, let me ask you. You said why some don't state, you act? Why don't you act in a little more positive? It's always trying to my get question you, to you. Get is, you, get you. And you know what? That's why nobody trusts the media anymore. My That's question why to you, people, how is that going to impact? Excuse me, you didn't hear me. That's why you used to work for the Times, and now you work for somebody else. Look, let me tell you something. Be nice. Don't Mr. be President, threatening. My question don't is, don't be threatening. My first question is, you said that you don't take responsibility, but you did disband the White House pandemic office. As a sort of coda to this video, I wanted to do a piece on an item of contention whether President Trump closed the pandemic response team. There was an editorial on that topic in the Washington Post, and that's what I'm putting this piece in. Normally this would be a separate video, but I'm beginning to think that I'm not going to be posting about topics during the Biden-Harris administration. Uh, what would be the point? So this coda is just going to be put on at the end here. It's my possible farewell to posting on any political topics as I look to safeguard my family and live life under the opposing administration of Biden-Harris. It's what uh, Americans do whenever their party loses an election, and this time is no different. I believe that the Biden administration obtained office through fraudulent means, but I'm not going to be posting about that every week or possibly ever. So, enjoy the next four to eight years of a Democrat socialism, and I will check in with you at some future date. Thank you.
President Donald Trump was accused of closing the White House's Pandemic Response Office. In this remarkable op-ed in the Washington Post, a member of the Pandemic Response Office responded to the accusation. No, the White House didn't dissolve its Pandemic Response Office. I was there. Opinion by Tim Morrison, March 16, 2020. Tim Morrison is a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and former senior director for counterproliferation and biodefense on the National Security Council. President Trump gets his share of criticism, but recently the president's critics have chosen curious ground to question his response to the coronavirus outbreak since it began spreading from Wuhan, China in December. It has been alleged by multiple officials of the Obama administration, including in the Post, that the president and his then national security advisor, John Bolton, dissolved the office at the White House in charge of pandemic preparedness. Before I led, the very directorate assigned that mission, the Counterproliferation and Biodefense Office, for a year, and then handed it off to another official who still holds the puss. I know the charge is specious. Now, I'm not naive. This is Washington. It's an election year. Officials out of power want back in power after November. But at the middle of a worldwide health emergency is not the time to be making tendentious accusations. When I joined the National Security Council in 2018, I inherited a strong and skilled staff in the Counterproliferation and Biodefense Directorate. It is true that the Trump administration has seen fit to shrink the NSC staff, but the blow occurred under the previous administration clearly needed a correction. Members of the Obama administration itself all agreed the NSC was too large and too operationally focused. The NSC staff had quadrupled in size to nearly 400 people. This is why Trump began streamlining the NSC staff in 2017. One such move at the NSC was to create the Counterproliferation and Biodefense Directorate, which was the result of consolidating three directorates into one. Given the obvious overlap between arms control and nonproliferation, weapons of mass destruction, terrorism, and global health and biodefense, it is this reorganization that critics have misconstrued or intentionally misrepresented. If anything, the combined directorate was stronger because related expertise could be commingled. The reduction of force in the NSC has continued since I departed the White House, but it has left the biodefense staff unaffected, perhaps a recognition of the importance of that mission to the president. The NSC is really the only place in government where there is a staff that ensures the commander-in-chief gets all the options he needs to make a decision and then makes sure that decision is actually implemented. You might ask, why does all this matter? Won't it just be a historical footnote? It matters when people play politics in the middle of a crisis. We are all less safe. We are less safe because public servants are distracted when they are dragged into politics. We're less safe because the American people have been recklessly scared into doubting the competence of their government to help keep them safe, secure, and healthy. And we're less safe because when we're focused on political gamesmanship, we're not paying enough attention to the real issues. For example, we should be united behind ensuring that U.S. companies are encouraged to return to our shores from China in the production of everything from medical face masks and personal protective equipment to vitamin C and penicillin. And we should be united in demanding to know why the Chinese Communist Party, CCP, was aware of the coronavirus outbreak in Wuhan early in December, maybe even November, and didn't tell the rest of the world when stopping the deadly spread might have been possible. Just as the United States has fought against false information aimed at our elections, we should fight back against CCP propagandists. They are not only campaigning against the use of the term Wuhan virus, a more geographically accurate description than Spanish flu ever was about the 1918 pandemic, but now also promoting the false claim that COVID-19 was created by the U.S. Army. There are real threats emanating from this pandemic. We need to focus on getting our response right and save the finger pointing for what comes after. This is the United States. We will get through this. And for the love of God, wash your hands. Now, that was the op-ed published in the Washington Post earlier in 2020. Hardly any of his recommendations were taken seriously by the news media or the Democratic Party. Both of them saw the virus as an opportunity 
to destroy President Trump's presidency. What was not a partisan pandemic in 2009 became a partisan pandemic in 2020. The Democratic Party destroyed our national unity in order to regain power.